So just a bit of a background uh, on ourselves. Um, so um, with me, I, prior to working at Consensus, worked at Deloitte in London and headed up quite a few of their blockchain initiatives under the strategy consulting department. Um, since then, I joined Consensus about seven months ago now um, and have been working solely on token economics um, and blockchain infrastructure. Uh, personally, I was in media for a number of years, a trader for a number of years, and eventually worked for a company called InvestFeed, started getting into the journalism side, wrote for CCN, Bitcoinist, uh, started consulting on projects, and eventually met my colleagues over at Consensus about half a year ago. Mm -hmm. And just to give you a bit of background as to how Rocco and I operate within this team, um, we've done primarily a lot of our work with a spoke of Consensus known as Token Foundry. Uh, the best way to pitch a token foundry is like an end-to-end -end consultancy. Um, so clients would go through our process of token design. Well, first they would have vetting to see if they're a viable project, uh, token design, and then they'll have uh, marketing, business development, and as well as a development team to focus on Solidity smart contracts. It kind of starts at the base level. Do you even have a business that you're running? Uh, are you actually profitable? And then you have to start there and then eventually go into the blockchain side. Do you even need a blockchain, which is a huge question in and of itself. Most of the time it's no, but for the cases that are yes, it eventually moves on to the token side. Do you actually need a token? Uh, and that also is a tricky question to deal with because most of the time you don't need a token. But yeah. for the times that you do yeah. over a token foundry, we were handling that. Yeah, I mean, it's a, one thing like I think Rocco and I definitely sort of figure out, try and or try to figure out early on is whether even if you need a token or whether a token's useful, whether it outdoes the pros that you'll find with a centralized solution, right? You know, because I think uh, a lot of like protocols that are being designed um, tend to forget that they're actually trying to operate or redefine an existing business model. So it's important to make comparisons between them. And a lot of the businesses actually building these protocols should find themselves mostly on the supply side of these protocols to be a network participant and making money on the protocol itself after building it. But yeah. with that, we're gonna cool. move into our presentation. So yeah, let's kick things off. Um, there's going to be a brief, of, we're going to give a brief um, sort of high level overview of what we consider tokens to be. Um, we'll then run through a different uh, sort of example of how we could tokenize, uh, when we should tokenize, and then some examples of like existing enterprise use cases that may not necessarily be focused specifically on tokenizing, but how we can see common patterns um, and where they're heading towards. So. Up here, like, there's loads of different definitions as to what a token is. Um, what we've coined up here, you know, a token is a shared digital artifact that represents a metered resource, is all to center around the fact that within these tokenized economies, there are specific boundaries that are being set up, right? And you have participants that are um, facilitating uh, this network or facilitating within this network. Um, they all want some sort of value and they're trading some sort of value exchange. Um, and the reason why we've named it as a kind of metered resource is, if, for example, Rocco and I uh, were the participants within this network and we've accumulated most of its value, it's likely that some of the other participants within this network would require some of this value in order to operate and function on this network. So it's a very high level um, sort of definition um, and that's a kind of uh, premise that we want to set um, some of the stuff that we're going to be talking about today. Part of the presentation also, we. Um in these slides themselves do refer to most, if not all cryptocurrencies themselves as tokens and we do understand that Tokens, in the sense that we traditionally see it, are these units that are built on top of blockchains, per se. But for the sake of the presentation, we do have it as kind of a lump definition. Uh, cryptocurrencies try to see them, but on the token and dice side as well. Yeah. So up here, we have, I guess, a few reasons why uh, tokens would want to be used in the first place. Um, the first reason that's set it up there is, I think, one of the primary cases that a lot of industries that are looking to approach blockchain or implement blockchain tend to quote a lot reduced transaction fees or disintermediation of rent-seeking platforms. Um, and yeah, that is, a, that is a common use point, but I want to focus on the latter half of that sentence. Um, the reason why we want to focus on using tokenized economies or incentives is that instead of having a centralized entity that acts as a trusted fixed point within this network or ecosystem that people are operating within, you have something that could be computable. Um, and that's reference to the second point that we have there. So for example, with Ethereum, you have smart contracts. Um, and the point that we make here is, you know, why use smart contracts in comparison to just centralized code? Um, one is the open source nature of it uh, and transparency so that everyone can sort of review and figure out whether it is indeed carrying out the function that it, um, that it was originally designed to. And the second, it provides a pretty cool bridge um, into leg existing legacy infrastructure. For example, if you used ETH or DAI, which is a stable coin. And to uh, talk about this for a second, we, we talk about tokens as programmable on Ethereum, but 
Ethereum has become the big dog in the room when it comes to tokens because of smart contracts, because you know, we can now program these tokens a lot more intricately than you used to be able to. But tokenization didn't start necessarily on Ethereum. Uh, tokenization actually started on Bitcoin with what were called color coins, and then eventually you had uh, master coin, which became the Omni layer, which is what Tether is built on now. And you also had counterparty, which were all existing uh, at the time, you know, that Ethereum kind of rose up and became the token juggernaut. Ethereum just offered smart contracts for the flexibility with tokenization, uh, ways in which we could use these resources a lot more efficiently on these networks. Uh, and I also wanted to draw your attention to the last point. Um, we, as a team, are token designers, but we're probably going to be your biggest skeptics when you get into a room with us, because our immediate premise is you guys don't need a token, right? And we work from there. So that last point is all about the kind of like reflection that we have with the kind of companies and clients that we've vetted uh, and worked with. Um, and the main point I want to get across there is there's a lot of work to get done before there's a hugely sustainable token economy. You know, there's going to be a lot of talks about utility tokens um, through the, throughout the duration of this conference. Um, and my take, and I think I share this with Rocco, is there's infrastructure plays that need to be built out, there's interoperability issues and obstacles that need to be overcome, um, as well as the basic scalability uh, stuff that a lot of um, companies like to talk about. Uh, yeah, as, as you guys mentioned, tokens are very, I want to say immature thing. Um, there's still, like you said, there's still a lot to be built out. A lot of people banked on the speculation cycle of 2017 where tokens became this big thing because you'd put money in and a lot of money came out, but eventually, thankfully, that capitulated. And entering 2018, the market hasn't been as great, so you've had a, less, a lot less people uh, building a lot of crap. There's still a lot of crap out there, but more people are thinking about what they're actually building. Um, also, to simplify this, when we talk with our team about tokens and what they do, we've kind of categorized it into four different buckets. Uh, the first is that tokens could be used to pay. These are tokens that you can give to people. These are your, pay your standard payment tokens. You can give them to people. They could be used as rebates. They could be used as coupons. They could be used for metering in a system, like a software license, and taken as metered. The second is voting, which you hear a lot about with uh, projects like ZeroX, projects like Maker, where voting is the main function of this token. I could use this token to signal my interest on one side or another of an issue. The third is actually locking a token. So these are your bonds, these are your work tokens uh, to provide services for a network. And lastly, what's actually I think being talked about now at this conference is also security tokens, this idea of representation. Tokens as you know this representative artifact. Um, and those four buckets kind of brought down, um, we're still trying to think around what else could be a token to be used for, but we kind of summarized it in those four main primitives at the time. And most tokens might have some spillover between different functionalities, but they mostly fit into those four buckets. And if you wanted to take that up a notch, um, you have the kind of like classification that we have up here. Um, I'm sure a lot of people in this room have heard sort of like the thrift between fungibility and non-fungibility. I mean, fungibility at its very highest level is essentially a part for part exchange, right? So if I had a dollar note, which is essentially a form of token, I guess, and gave it to you and you exchanged your one dollar note for me, you know, I'm not going to have an issue with that. Likely it's of the same value. However, <laughs> if I went to a shop and I used dollars to buy I don't know, an orange, and then decided I didn't want the orange and went back to the guy and said, hey, could I exchange this orange for that Snickers bar? He'd be like, well, I'm not too sure, because everyone has different perceptions on subjective value. Yeah, it's, it's the way in which you think cash is fungible. So I go up to someone in this audience, I hand them a $20 bill, great. They give me a 10 and two fives back. We understand that it's the same exact value. Cash is fungible, but if you lend me your Tesla Model S, please, I'd love to drive one, and I, Bring, I bang it up, I get the thing into an accident, and totally destroyed, Elon Musk is crying, and I bring you back a totally new Model S. Great, but those are two different items. Same car, but different car. Non-fungible, unlike cash. Yeah, I mean, yeah, following on from Rocco's point on the non-fungible side of things, I'm sure all of you have heard of uh, CryptoKitties. It's essentially a representation. It's trying to capture this sort of subjective value. Um, there have been interesting forays into like different kind of Ethereum standards, like the 998, which looks at like um, different kind of data architecture structuring where like you could have, for example, a house and uh, within that token you could represent uh, the house itself, the land underneath it, the assets that are contained within it, and how that may be represented in a physical kind of form. Yeah, speaking to the composable, the 998 standard that is talking about, another way of thinking about it is a, is a vending machine. Each vending machine is unique in that it would be its own unique token. It's each its own unique non-fungible token, like a 721, and the snacks inside would be fungible. All those bags of chips exist as fungible items inside of this non-fungible vending machine. Yeah. You're going to notice soon that we're kind of like the analogy guys. We like using 
like commonplace analogies to try and help people understand. Um, but the main point I want to drive home here is it's nev it doesn't necessarily have to be either or. And I want Rocco to talk more about um, Bitcoin and its fungibility versus Monero and its fungibility. That's the thing. It's If you talk about Bitcoin, a lot of people talk about the anonymous nature of it. Um, you know, you have these addresses that are each unique. The problem is there are a lot of third-party gateways. There's a lot of history tracking with Bitcoin. You could eventually, there's services like Chainalysis that try to link users to transactions. We have enough third-party gateways now that are bringing people in that you could actually track the transactions. So if I put up my Bitcoin address, you know, I've, let's say I've gone through Coinbase, they know that I'm Gregory Rocco, this is my Bitcoin address. Therefore, the, the, and the, the thing about fungibility is, if someone, were, the, the idea of fungibility is that all units are treated the same. So let's say I had this dirty Bitcoin, for example, that went through the Silk Road, you know, one of those dark web markets, and a service decided, hey, they saw that this Bitcoin went through this dark web, we're not going to take it. They could blacklist it because they know where it's gone. Whereas something like Zcash, especially in the case of shielded transactions, Zcash has a way to anonymize transactions, or Monero, which has confidential transactions and ring signatures, there's no way of actually tracing those transactions, um, which is why Monero is used heavily in the dark web. Whenever they kind of get these stints on dark webs, they're able to seize all the Bitcoin, but they don't know where all the Monero is. Yeah. Um, as a quick idea of fungibility. Cool. So, I mean, if we were to look at like some examples um, of, you know, a question that is often asked to us is, okay, well, what's really out there um, and what's being worked upon? Um, so we, we kind of like brainstormed um, as to what kind of examples we'd want to use here or like speak briefly about. Um, but some of the stuff that we wanted to go on, I think, started off with um, Augur. And maybe, Rocky, you want to take this one? Sure. Um, Augur, you've probably heard about uh, Predictions Market. The project actually started a couple of years ago. They were originally going to build on Bitcoin, uh, shut that down eventually, built on Ethereum. Took a number of years to get the smart contracts audited. But it's basically Predictions Markets. You know, is this, is this thing going to happen at this date? Yes or no? People place bets. Um, and the work, Augur is a good example of like a bond. You know, you could lock tokens up. You're locking tokens up essentially to work for the network. Um, as mentioned, you have different market participants. And as, as I just said, tokens use a license to bond. You basically um, are, are being the oracle in the network. You're reporting on the event that happened. So will the Dodgers you know, beat Boston in six, which I hope so. Um, I could be an oracle for that predictions market. I would have to lock up Augur tokens, and I receive fees you know, based on me reporting on that outcome. I'm locking up Augur to tokens to be a participant in that network, and I'm earning on those actual predictions markets for providing that information. Um, similar to the ways in which we think about larger scale networks like Bitcoin, Bitcoin or Ethereum, we're providing hashing power, we're providing energy, and in, in response, we're receiving Bitcoin or Ethereum. We're getting paid to perform that service. We're getting paid to perform that work. We're getting paid to perform that security for that network. Um, it all sounds like a pretty good idea, but um, a point I want to bring here is, uh, you know, how it actually translates into real life. Um, quite quickly after um, this platform was launched and usable, um, we saw the formation of, like, assassination markets, which is uh, an Who interesting play on uh, something that could be considered, you know, next level or, or new world. Um, and also, just to quickly go back to work tokens, too. You know, these, these, to these tokens, thankfully, people are thinking more about these networks and, you know, how you could actually use these work tokens, so to speak. There are a couple of other ones, like Mainframe, that's being built. Uh, if you've heard of LivePeer, they're doing transcoding, similar work model. Uh, and also, one project that's gone through Token Foundry, Foam, uh, for providing location data to the network. You are essentially working, providing this data in this mesh network of location, and you're earning for doing so in that model. Yeah. I think, like, um, if you want to take it at, like, a high level, the best way to kind of think of, like, a work token or, like, it's abstract ideas that are used is like a taxi medallion, right? Um, so if you consider the very first person that bought a taxi medallion at whatever it was, like say $300, um, they bought this taxi medallion, slapped it on the front of their window, and that makes them a taxi driver, right? So they drive around and they offer this service. Now, people who ride within this taxi, how do they pay for this taxi? Is it in tokens or cash? It's cash, right? So they pay by cash and this medallion just allows him to work. Now, everyone else sees him uh, or her driving a taxi and allowing it to work and think, okay, I want to do the same thing. And they jump into their car and they try to do the same thing. Are they allowed to perform the work legally or within the confines of this network? No, not really. But if they buy this medallion, it allows them to work. And now we have a taxi medallion that's worth in the several hundreds of thousands. Um, and it's an example of like a license to work. Um, obviously, you now have like contenders like uh, Uber and uh, Airbnb, which I'll talk about a little later, um, who sort of like disrupted that platform 
Um, but we now see, we're now seeing a tendency towards like uh, uh, a disintermediation of power within these corporations because they're now speaking to like the SEC on whether they can give uh, you know open equity offerings towards their drivers or their homeowners. So it's interesting to see the kind of trends that are being taken. And uh, now we have, I think everyone's favorite token at this point because it got listed on Coinbase, um, zero X. And the reason why, and why th this is a, an example purely of a governance asset. Um, originally, the token was, uh, you know. It had this idea of payments where, actually, give me, to give you some background, 0x is a decentralized exchange protocol built on Ethereum. Um, you know, we, we as, as a user, in smart contract, you're putting up what you want to trade for what, someone accepts that offer, the offer is made, uh, no exchange has to have custody of the actual assets themselves. What 0x tried to do with their token was uh, allow the token to basically govern the network and any network upgrades. Um, and they originally thought that all these relayers, so these exchanges building on this protocol, would trade against this asset. So you had these relayers come up like Radar Relay, you had Paradex, you have DDEX, um, and ZeroX's main vision, okay, they're gonna trade against this asset because they're gonna want it to govern the protocol because they're building on top of it. Turns out, no one wants to trade against it because it, because it becomes a pain in the ass to actually use the asset. So all the exchanges that built on top of the ZeroX protocol eventually uh, stopped trading against it, now they all trade against Ethereum. But the idea behind the asset itself was to govern this network, which was very different in 2017 when everyone was making a payment token for their network. In 2017, all these large ICOs were like, okay, we're the de facto currency of this social network. We're the de facto currency of dog food. Like everyone's putting this payment token on their network. Xerox at least gave a little bit of thought to the voting aspect and made a governance asset. Um, they're still working through it, but there's someone I know who put out a blog post, uh, Phil Vanello from Ikigai Asset Management on, um, the fact that it, does it cost more to actually fork 0x because it is open source, so you could fork it, take it, make your own exactly how it is right now, or buy enough tokens to actually control the sway of the network? And it turns out it's usually a lot cheaper just to fork the network. So pure governance assets still have a way to go. 0x is a great example of it. Another example of a governance asset is Maker, as I said earlier, but Maker is actually governing a stable coin. That's it's a whole other rabbit hole. Um, but 0x's main vision, pure governance asset. A point I'd like to make here as well is, as Rocco mentioned, 0x started with a different purpose for their token. You know, it was to reduce fees or facilitate transactions on this network. The point being made here is they then made the iteration and saying, okay, well, governance is more of a particular issue to solve here if we're going to allow participants to operate. Um, I'd also say that probably one of the, not mistakes, but one of the biggest things that 0x could have focused on doing initially was be the first relay on their network. I think that would have solved for a lot of liquidity issues that they see now. Yeah, a lot of what we talk about is when someone raises money to build these protocols, these protocols are very valuable and 0x has become the golden child in the space because they're actually delivering code. It's un an unfortunate low bar to set delivering code um, for what you're doing. And the thing is we realize, and we talk about this all the time, these people who are building these networks, if 0x, 0x did, did build a bulletin board style exchange, but they didn't build like an order book exchange. And if they were building the first order book relayer on top of their own protocol, there's so much more value that they could have captured. Whereas there's not a lot of value they're capturing purely being 0x themselves. Um, and one other way we could have seen 0x play out differently is if they tried to use the token to incentivize relayers to share liquidity. Mm -hmm. However, the thing is it's more profitable to be this relayer, to be this exchange on top of 0x and silo your own liquidity because you make a lot more money doing it. Cool. So now comes the question of when do you tokenize? You know, when is it when is it kind of useful? Um, the point I want to make here: don't get scared about sort of terms like dry and wet computation. The point I'm trying to drive home here is within. If you're ever talking about setting up a network on Ethereum, there's a lot of chat about smart contracts, right? And that's determinable code, right? Zeros and ones, yes or no. You know, does this um, uh, condition get satisfied? Yes or no? Okay, then this is going to happen. Um, so that's when something's well-defined, when something's computable. Um, the issue arises, or the vulnerable points within a network arises when you're looking at the wet space. Um, the points I'm making here is, let's take, for example, a common use case which enterprises are trying to solve for right now, and some which are exploring tokens. Uh, supply chain, right? You have several different parties. Um, there's a lot of miscommunication within, within them. Um, parties don't necessarily know each other and can't necessarily trust each other, but do they have to trust each other? Can they use a token for something like this? Um, the issue here is, with a lot of supply chains, there's a lot of physical assets being transferred, right, from source to endpoint. So the point then arises is, okay, cool, um, how can I guarantee that um, 
this bag of coffee beans, which has been sourced from somewhere in Africa, is the same bag of coffee beans that has arrived at my retail store. How do I know that someone hasn't added stuff to that bag or shifted, some, shifted it out for something else or tainted it in some way, shape, or form? Um, I was at a workshop about three weeks ago um, where we explored some of these concepts with um, some enterprises and what they're working on. And you know, there were talks on like IoT devices that they could use or some kind of like bio tracker. And yeah, these are all viable things. Um, the issue is that is a point of contention. You know, people can address that. That's something physical that people can go and address, manipulate in some way, shape, or form. So the standards of like how this infrastructure is going to be used or what is the recommended infrastructure to use between parties is an interesting one, as well as like the consortium approach. Yeah, and I think two major takeaways to take from this, if anything, is that blockchains are not truth machines you can't have pinpoint accuracy in this wet space and have it on a blockchain. We still require truck driver Joe to list, you know, to signal down in his Hyperledger instance that this is that bag of coffee beans. Mm. And to bring it back to one of the examples we used earlier of Augur. Augur is this concept in action. In Augur, you're locking tokens to report on these events. You still have to report the outcome. Did the Dodgers sweep Boston? Did they win in six? Yes or no. But Augur, to handle this, has like this contention mechanism where if people think that the oracle, the person reporting the information, is, is not being truthful, there's an arbitration process that might eventually lead to a fork of the network because you can't tokenize truth. Blockchain is not a truth machine. It's hard to handle the wet space. There are ways in which we can do it. There are ways in, in which we can incentivize people to do the right thing, but it's not always perfect. I mean, it comes down to a much larger problem, which I know um, a few big players in the space are trying to solve, and that's the identity side of things, right? Um, you know, uh, a lot of people try to figure out, well, what does this all root back to, into? And it is, you know, for a large part, identity. You know, how do I know that that person is who he says he is uh, within this party that he's operating with? Can I attest that he is uh, or she is uh, delivering this good at this time and interacting with this specific object that is hardware? The reason why some of the base chains are so easy to manage and are so successful is that they don't really require too much wet information, so to speak. A predictions market requires you to come out, requires you to you know, say that this outcome happened, yes or no. When you take a network like Bitcoin, you need two things. You need miners mining the network for the reward that they have, and you need people running full nodes to verify transactions. If both are operating as they are, that's it. Network runs, the chain runs. Whereas we get into wetter issues with tokenization, take Augur and predictions markets, then you have complicated arbitration issues. So Rock and I were thinking of like a couple of things that we can list uh, that we think are leading token use cases and things that are slightly more limited. Uh, if I were to pick a few from the leading token cases, Rocco and I have spoken about uh, the work licensing and bonding with example to Augur. Um, the disintermediation of rent-seeking platforms, that's the one that, you know, a lot of people like to talk about. You know, how can I reduce costs of transactions between parties and save money on both fronts so that we could have a better offering or take larger profit in whatever service providers or service offerings that we build upon this protocol? Um, and I'll go back to my point about Uber and Airbnb. You know, we see an interesting trend with these centralized companies. You know, why have they contacted the SEC and spoken about open equity offerings? Um, it's, it's all about a redistribution of power, you know, because um, necessarily they may not know, you know, their customer pool is the best set of information that they could use in terms of guidance and trends and plans of where they want to take their company to. So if they're able to give some sort of power and governing rights, back to the problem of governance, um, to the participants on that network, it plays well for them. Um, the digital representation of ownership, um, I guess that could tie into a lot of what is being spoken at this conference about security tokens. It's all about kind of a representation of assets. Um, traditional securities um, are, I guess, somewhat going to be easier to sort of represent in a tokenized form. I say somewhat because it hasn't been defined um, justly just yet. But what's really interesting about the security side of things is I think there's going to be a formation of different kinds of asset classes. Um, because it'll allow liquidity between participants that weren't necessarily accredited before, for instance. Um, but all of the legalized kind of framework needs to be uh, mapped out as of yet. It's still very young. Um, and a few of our colleagues are actually going to be speaking more about that um, later on. Um, yeah, the t and the reason why we kind of think working is the leading use case of tokens, especially in public networks, is essentially because it's measurable. It's, you know, if I'm an oracle in the Augur network, I'm going to go back to this because it was what we explained earlier, I can measure how much I'm going to make based on being an oracle for these different predictions markets. Um, work seems to be this one massive way 
that it's easy to measure valuation in terms of tokenization. We know how much value is going to flow through this certain application and what being a worker for this network will entitle me to. Um, where it gets trickier, obviously, are these issues of governance and payments. So far, 0x can be summed up as what does it cost to fork the network versus what does it cost to take over the entire voting scheme of 0x. Um, and what I also go to is this asset called Maker. If you've heard of the stablecoin DAI, Maker is a little easier to value than 0x, whereas 0x is, you know, cost of forking co versus cost of 51% of the vote, whereas Maker is more along the lines of collateralizing DAI. I'm not going to get into it, but basically there's a floor to be measured in Maker's system of governance. It's not as easy to pinpoint like work tokens are, but it's starting to get there. And moving on to this slide, we have our limited use cases, which end up essentially being these forms of payment tokens. Yeah, no, I mean, the point that I guess we're trying to make here with sort of medium of exchange is it adds unnecessary business friction in a lot of cases. I'm not saying in all cases, but in a lot of cases it does. For example, if I ask my mom to go and use this protocol, she's going to be like, okay, cool, what do I need to do? Uh, yeah, you need to spend $50 to buy um, FunCoin, uh, use FunCoin to purchase said service, uh, and then convert it back into fiat and when you're ready. And she also has to buy FunCoin, you know, on that exchange that really no one can pronounce the name, and, and it's like in that weird country that no one else can pronounce yeah. the name, like, and all their, you know, they have a million shell companies, but go on the exchange, mom, buy it first, and your money will be fine. Oh, wait, we've got time. Give them the Berlin experience. Oh, the Berlin experience. Yeah, the shit coin. <laughs> the so shit. when we think about payment tokens, it's this idea of friction. So in 2017, you had all these companies raising all this money and creating this new currency. Number one, don't be the next Bitcoin because you're not going to be. You're not going to have the same liquidity. You're not going to have the same network effects. Your token's not going to replace money. Um, and it's not cool to have this token on your actual platform because, as we mentioned, it introduces friction. You have to, okay, if I want to use a service, I have to, I can't just pay for the service outright with assets that I have. I have to go and find fund token on this exchange that, you know, was, you know, not even audited or uh, has a history of scamming users, get that token finally, then use the service. I'm buying the token, essentially get rid of it as fast as possible, and then the company receiving it is getting rid of it as fast as possible as well. Um, and nothing illustrated this point to me of how much friction is involved than when I first landed in Berlin. It was my first time to Berlin. It was great. I was going there for Berlin Blockchain Week, which was a couple weeks ago at this point. And I get off the plane. I get to this mall, and I have to use the bathroom. And I'm like, great. This is awesome. You know, it's an open bathroom. It's clean. I'm like, I'm finally landed. I'm great to be there. And I get there, and apparently it requires money. I'm like, okay, great. I'll use a dot. Oh, wait, I need euros. So <laughs> thankfully, my friend... Steve, he's also my colleague, had a euro. It's a $1 coin. And I'm like, holy crap. I didn't have this coin. I needed to get it. I had no idea where to change my money at the time. It was going to be complicated to change dollars to euros because the, exchange, the machine didn't actually take my credit card. Um, so he gives me this coin. And I'm like, great, I got it. That was annoying because thankfully Steve had it because it would be a pain in the ass if he didn't. I put the coin in, able to use the bathroom. I, I walk out and I'm like, wow, that's a real example of a shit coin. I wouldn't have been able to done it. It had friction to actually use the service, and that was ridiculous. And then I thought about it, and I'm like, wait, this is exactly the experience everyone would have using platforms that with payment tokens. Yep. To use that platform, I'd have to figure out how to buy that token, or in this case, get that euro, to use that service. No one wants to do that. You're going to drive away customers, and it's a terrible experience overall. I got to use the bathroom. Steve had the, Steve had the token. Yeah. Maybe eJazz will have the token to use the other service, but maybe he won't. I think a good point to make here is any kind of like successful kind of blockchain project or tokenized platform doesn't necessarily need to show the user that they're using blockchain. You know, I should be able to use fiat or whatever it is to operate until there's any kind of just movement in a direction where we want to use a universal kind of token. But until then, it's important not to force it onto people. Um, I think there's like a point I want to make here is like an issue that we see with a lot of these protocols is usage, right? And you could always argue that there's, you know, it's really early on in the space and uh, we don't have many people that understand how a lot of this works. And, you know, for by part of effect, that's true. Um, but, you know, I, I don't want to be biased. So let's, um, let's go with the consensus kind of thing. So add token, for example. Um, so it's formed on a TCR, which is like a, basically a token curated registry. It's a, it's a list that's curated via tokens. For those who um, don't know, imagine we had to get everyone in this room to coordinate on a, a list of the best blockchain projects. We're all users in the network. We all kind of have experience there. But how can we all coordinate on what should be added to this list decentrally? No one, no one is here saying, I'm the leader of the list. I'm going to be putting the items into the list. We all have to figure it out and vote on mm -hmm. which ones get added and which ones get challenged. Yep. So 300 million tokens were dispersed uh, at the ICO, if you like. Um, what percentage of that, or users who own those tokens, do you think voted 
Shout out percentages. Any kind of percentage. What do you think? How many people actually used it? Someone said 20. Oh my god. Someone said 2. So, oh, so, all right, the person who said 2 it wins. Uh, it was about it was about 2.4% turnout. And that's the issue there, right? Um, we worked it out. We did like a little um, infrastructure analysis in our team. $5,000. That's and what you needed to do to run that network. And you can kill the network $5,000 too. In that instance, I could game it in $5,000. So you know these these are things that we need to sort of figure out when we're sort of like supplanting a network, you know, or, or sorry, implanting a network. You know, what do you need to do to seed usage? Uh, what are the partnerships they need to form? Where are you distributing your tokens geographically uh, across industry? Who's using your tokens? Who is going to want to curate and govern and all of these different? Roles? And even talking about a network with governance, like think about the ICO process and you know who gets tokens. Yeah, well, you know, we we sold twenty percent to the public. We have you know. 10% to the team, 10% to marketing, 10% to beer, 10% to blackjack, 20% uh, to advisors, and then 10% for exchange listings. In a network that has to be governed efficiently by stakeholders in a network, do you honestly think that's an efficient way of distributing resources? Mm. No. Yep. Um, so what we have here is a very, very brief insight into the first thing that we think about when we're dealing with token design and mapping out our architecture. I realize we've spoken a lot about real use cases and perhaps not more on how we actually think when we design tokens. So here's a brief oversight. Um, these are the fundamental principles of market design. Uh, market design is really important within tokenization for the following reasons. Um, so for the first one, thickness. Thickness is all about bootstrapping a network. In order for your network to be successful and for a tokenized sort of platform to work, you need users, right? You need people who aggregate on this platform and use it for some way, shape, or form. Um, the second point on congestion is what happens if it gets too busy. Um, so remember of our definition earlier on about tokens, it's a metered resource. So if you have a lot of users on a network, there's gonna be at some point limited usability within these resources. So it's all about sort of managing congestion. You know, um, Will each different participant at a certain point have access to all available options that the network would allow them to use. Yeah, and can the network actually handle that? Considering that most tokens are built off of base blockchains, we are talking about scalability solutions all the time. But take, for example, at the height of CryptoKitties in the Ethereum network. You can get any transactions through because people were clogging the network trading digital cats. People were joking that the network was coughing up a hairball. It just wasn't working. It was too congested because there were too many participants operating on the network, and the network couldn't actually handle that. And the last point is on safety. Uh, long story short, if I want to be using your platform, I need to know that my transactions are going to be safe, that the participants that I'm operating on will uh, transact with me in, this, in the uh, method that I, uh, uh, that I would expect them to. Um, so that's my point there. So now we go into a few enterprise examples, and I'll try and breeze through this pretty quickly. Um, so these are sort of like existing companies that have announced certain initiatives or that are looking into different kinds of things. I'll cover it all at very high level, and if you guys want to sort of dig deep uh, into it after this talk, um, please come and approach us uh, and we can chat more. Um, so let's go with Visa, for example. Um, Visa just announced uh, a B2B uh, payments infrastructure that I think they've been building on uh, Hyperledger. Um, and the main point that they're trying to solve here is, well, remittance between their customers. So how are they solving for this? Um, they say that they've, and I say, that, say this because it's in every article that was released yesterday, um, they're trying to tokenize customer data. Now, I don't know what that means, but I do know that they're doing that on a private distributed ledger, right? So we're looking at Hyperledger for this instance. So I can see ways that they're trying to manage this. For example, if I have a consortium that is governed by a centralized authority, haha, you know, it's not decentralized technology being used by a centralized authority may not necessarily be the worst thing, but they identify who the participants are that are operating within this network. Uh, they'll probably have some f uh, form of KYC, but they're saying that the tokenized form of PII data, so personal information, uh, is going to be kept anonymous. Um, and the way that they have talk talked about it, and I'm really keen to hear more about their architecture when they release uh, information later on down the line, is they use some kind of universal indicator. I don't know what that means. And that's an issue, but that's sort of reference back to the wet space that I was speaking about earlier on. What's this point of uh, sort of vulnerability? What's this point of transaction that'll sort of allow me to assume that my data is going to be safe and not accessible by anyone else? And to this, enterprises a lot of the times are looking to play the blockchain ball game, um, trying to figure out where it'll help. You know, we have shared databases. Okay, we have now shared databases of cryptographic signing. Um, 
we honestly, I think we've gone over this a couple of times with our team. We think that the future of enterprise is not going to be um, on really public chains at all. You're really not going to see these enterprises using Bitcoin or Ethereum for anything other really than notary. Um, they might have these consortia, these permission ledgers. They might have different actors in this consortia, all writing to this permission ledger that they control kind of the basics of, and they might notarize to a public chain, for example, as that kind of back end of this is what happened at this time in our little permission network. I definitely agree with Rocco uh, as that's the circumstance that it is right now. But I think in the future, we're actually going to see a graduation from private DLTs um, to mapping out with more public chains. What that looks like right now is in notarized form. Hey, I want to stamp my records uh, and have a like a snapshot of what my company is doing right now, but I'm not necessarily going to expose certain parts. So if you look at like uh, the privatized version of Ethereum, which is Quorum, right? Um, the main benefits that Quorum has is, hey, we have faster scalability. Oh, how are you doing fast scalability? Because they have a smaller number of nodes that are needed to achieve consensus, right? Um, but the main point here is they can interoperate with the public chain because not only can you have public and private transactions, you can have public and private smart contracts. Now, think of a smart contract uh, if a business was using it as their business strategy, right? They may not necessarily want to allow their competitors to see their strategy or what exactly they're doing, but if they allow certain transactions to be interoperable and visible to those competitors, which they know within their own consortium, i.e. the node validator status, then that could be a way that that could work. But it's all about that varying degree of centrality, right? Um, I think Rocco coined it as like flexible centrality, you know, figuring out how much you want to allow people to see and how much you don't want to see. I'd say currently right now in the young market that it is where you see volatility curves going up and down every day with cryptocurrencies, as everyone likes to term every kind of crypto asset, um, you know, there's obviously a bit of uncertainty, but once these kind of infrastructures that are being mapped out, you mean you look at like what Clover's working on um, by Amber Baldet, who's the ex head of blockchain at JP Morgan, you look at what Blake Masters is working on with digital asset, they're all trying to bridge the gap between private distributed ledgers and public distributed ledgers. So it's interesting to see how that's being developed uh, over time. Um, another point, I, I, I was going to mention stuff about um, uh, CSS, but I want to focus on something more recent. Uh, who hears from PwC? We are safe. OK, cool. Um, so I was at San Francisco. I was at, oh, this is being videoed. OK, sorry. Um, so I was at San Francisco Blockchain Week um, a few weeks ago. And I walk into this sort of similar uh, conference room. And there's a huge booth at the back. There's three booths at the back. Uh, there's PwC. There's a company called Cred and some other company. So I'm like, okay, cool. Um, and they made a massive announcement that day that PwC is partnering or has incubated this company called Cred. So I'm like, cool. Um, I go up to Cred and I say, hey, uh, what are you guys doing? Uh, we're a loan services platform. I'm like, oh, cool. How does that work? Um, so the current issue we're seeing right now is in this bear market, a lot of people who bought crypto, Bitcoin and ETH, um, want to maintain their crypto in the hopes that it goes up again, but can't liquidate right now because they've put a lot of money into it. So what we're offering them is, hey, give us your Bitcoin, give us your ETH, we'll give you the equivalent in fiat value right now, and then you pay us interest over the period of time. So I'm like, oh, that sounds amazing. Uh, what interest are you guys charging? 11% minimum. Blockchain like, magic. That is amazing, 11%. So what could your token possibly be used for? And lo and behold, it was about discounts discounts on the interest. So I was like, oh, how does that work? So when you give them Bitcoin and when you give them ETH at the start, you also need to purchase a set amount of whatever token it was and lock it up, which means that it um, they'll agree on a set price that that gets reduced to. So instead of 11%, you know, they're charging you a very, very reasonable fee of around 9%. So I'm like, okay, cool. So that's how that works. So my next question was then, um, that's interesting. Um, can people who are only putting down deposits buy that token that will allow them their interest to depreciate. And they're like, no, no, no. So I'm like, oh, right. So you can buy it on a secondary market and I don't have to put down a loan deposit. And they're like, yes. So then my question was, how are you going to avoid for sort of pump and dump schemes, for example, or other people that buy a shit ton of those tokens and then trade that on the secondary market? How are you going to protect people who you've already instantiated a certain percentage depreciation? Artificial value. Blockchain magic. Blockchain magic. Thank you. On cue. I'm going to point to you every time I want that. Um, but no, you would have thought that was the end of it, but remember there was three boots and there was one on the other end. So I said, hey, what are those guys doing with you? And they said, oh, forgot to tell you, um, we're also creating a stable coin. I'm like, great, what's the stable coin going to be used for? And they said, well, um, 
as you could probably imagine, like we're taking Bitcoin and Ethereum because we know it's going to appreciate in value. Um, this is not trading advice. But um, what about all the other ERC20 tokens that everyone owns but wants to convert? Well, the idea that they're giving is, hey, uh, take those ERC20 tokens, convert them into this stable coin that, that we've just created, and then you could use that to add collateral into our network, only because it was then going to be a uniform resource or token that people could attribute value to. So really, uh, like, in my opinion, it was kind of like an unnecessary use case, but maybe PwC has uh, other interests. When I was speaking to them, they had uh, uh, certain answers which didn't really make sense, but hey, you know, uh, use cases on blockchain. Definitely a successful token toilet. I hope no one's listening to this. Uh, um, the point I want to make uh, finally on these uh, these two uh, use cases, um, one of them uses a token, one of them is not. Um, the point about Walmart is uh, you may have seen recently that they made an announcement with uh, using IBM's Food Trust blockchain. So what does that involve? Essentially, this is the traditional supply chain thing. And what Walmart has done, or what they've recently announced is, all their leafy green providers, i.e. people who are producing spinach or whatever the hell for them, all their suppliers need to jump on their um, Food Trust IBM blockchain thing by the end of next year. If not, you're cut. So the initial articles that came out on this was, oh, this is really funny because this is like a centralized company trying to impose decentralized technology. Uh, that's true. Um, the argument I'd have is I have a good test case to now look at and see what works and what doesn't. The people who are experimenting with these ridiculous kind of POCs are the people that should have the money to dispose with that, right? These are all Walmart suppliers. They're testing on Walmart suppliers and seeing whether it works or not. If this crashes and burns, they not only have an alternative solution, which they can just go back to and work in parallel, for example, but I can also see where the pain points lie and then what needs to be iterated upon uh, in that instance. Everyone's probably KYC'd on this platform because it's the Food Trust Ledger, which has worked on Hyperledger. Um, but it, I'm, it's an interesting use case to see whether this actually does reduce transaction costs. Um, what's also interesting with this infrastructure that they're using is they allow um, very, easy, very easy integration with legacy systems. More importantly, people who are using paper and stuff. They have some kind of scanning API system which will allow them to upload docs. Uh, I'm keen to see how they validate these docs and whether they know it's authentic or not. So it's interesting to see. But final point I make on that is um, an instance that you've seen now is Kruger's, who is like one of their main competitors, have now joined this consortium. It's all about sort of co cooperation between people. Um, consortiums are a thing that's been chucked out a lot for a long time, and people have been doing it incorrectly. But this is an example of how you're getting players in the room, which you wouldn't normally have considered, to play ball with each other. Yeah, and as mentioned earlier, um, talk about enterprises with public and permission, and permission blockchains. Uh, I think enterprises, instead of using those phrases, I think enterprises will always opt in for a system of flexible trust rather than decent decentralization as the buzzword as we know it. Um, basically, users having, the, you know, a, a, a widespread in a consortia rather than, you know, a single entity that they could rely on or these systems built between a whole group of actors rather than one. Yeah. Uh, and the second point with Singapore Airlines, this is an example of the limited use case that we mapped out early on, which is rewards tokens. So what have they done? They've signed 16 uh, purveyors of whatever kind of business or services onto their services platform, um, and they're essentially allowing an interoperable nature between their air miles, i.e. now tokens, uh, for a one-for-one -one or value exchange for, um, I don't know, a hotel room, for example. So say if 300 air miles or 3,000 air miles is worth uh, $200 in real life, you could then exchange that part for part value for their hotel partnership. What's interesting here is in the 16 partnerships that they've made, around 12 of them have agreed on the part for part value, and the other four um, have not agreed with that. So now they have a different exchange rate. And that brings it back to the flexible sort of trust. And I gave a presentation a couple of days ago in Chicago at Loyalty Live on loyalty points, similar to what Singapore Airlines is doing. Um, along with this, it's great to see that you finally have these pricing mechanisms. These tokens, obviously, are probably going to be on permission systems. Um, it's going to be, you know, they'll have set rules basically on how to move them around. But also, I don't think that you'll have um, players in the same vertical be as open to it. I might be able to ex exchange my Singapore Airlines bucks for my Uber buck because they're totally different verticals. But at the end, of the, the end of the day, all these airlines are incentivized to basically create these gravity wells in their own vertical. Mm. Like Singapore isn't going to be able to really part with their points for United points because they want as many customers flying Singapore as possible. Yep. So that's also going to be very tough in these instances. But good example of tokenization. I would say good in public sense, but they're using tokens, yeah. enterprise, permission plays. Yeah.
Um, and that is the end of our presentation. Thank you guys for listening. Uh, and if you have any questions, let us know. I'm not sure. How much time do we have left? Yeah. Do we, do we have time? Do we have time for questions? Yeah, 12 minutes. 12 minutes. All right. Um, if anyone has any questions, please. Yeah. Any kinds of questions that you guys may have. Or if not, just come up and talk to us oh. afterwards. Yeah. Oh, I think it was governance from the start, but it was like, cause the emphasis more is now like, yeah. we're the governed. Yeah. Well, that's, well, that's the idea behind governance is that it's, it's, again, and this also comes back to the way we think about valuation too, it's hard to value subjectivity, the ways in which we think, you know, we might have a shared common goal for the future of the protocol, but the ways in which we get there we might see as more valuable for each one. I know they're experimenting with um, Futurarchy, which is, this is basically, we have the same, we vote on where we're going, we bet on how to get there. Um, but again, valuing based on kind of like what we're talking about here where it's like, People are going to obviously vote on stuff for the betterment of the protocol, which make the asset more valuable, but it might not actually be better for the protocol in a huge, it's hard to measure that kind of value. Whereas work tokens, we have these, these predictions markets are set up. We know money is flowing through them. We know being an Oracle is going to get us that money where this is more kind of betting on, Hey, will this make the protocol better? Will it make it more valuable? It's hard to get a concrete measurement. Um, but the value proposition for a governance asset such as zero X is that we're going to vote on the best things to make the protocol mo protocol more valuable, but it's hard to measure that. But the question, like, yeah, I mean. <laughs> The only value, I think the only value metric that the tokens have right now is, is, is the voting open yet for Xerox? I'm not sure if they have the contracts audited. So right now the only thing that's giving Xerox its current value is speculation and the fact that it got added to Coinbase. Um, and that's the thing, it's like how do you concretely measure this at the moment even with the voting system not even built? That's completely like a fair point right now, right? Yeah. I think a lot of people have very uh, speculative natures to the tokens that they kind of purchase. Yeah. Um, and I think that's more of like a knowledge barrier of people understanding how these uh, necessary protocols work. I mean, at the very high level, uh, if you were being you know, speculative and you wanted your token to appreciate in price, you'd want your network to function exactly how it's meant to, right? And you want to have users on that platform. So if your governance mind and framework isn't in the right kind of uh, ideation session in like terms of allowing people to use this, uh, this protocol in the long term, the appreciation of your token won't necessarily happen as you expect. Yeah, but let's, let's chat about this afterwards. Let's sure. have some other questions. Um, oh, uh, I think I, was, uh, I'll just go with you first and then we'll come sorry. to you. Um, yeah, like, so I think like um, forking is a very easy thing to kind of bring up as to uh, how some of these things would work. I mean, so if I were to take it from the high level, is that um, option viable? Sure. Yeah, it is viable. Uh, whether this will be something that will be pursued down the line, uh, less so because I think that there are certain interoperable infrastructures that need to be figured out between all the people within the EEA, for example. Like, this is something that we see every day. Like, we have a very, very good working community within the EEA, and they're discussing all these different things. But remember, they have different aligned verticals. Um, and that's the same thing with industry, right? Um, even if we did that with on the uh, Ethereum infrastructure as a whole, there will then be questions on how much sort of transparency they want to allow, how they want to reach consensus. Like, the POA side of things is, Interesting, but I wouldn't say everyone aligns on that. And also, I think right now it's also about capturing hearts and minds. Um, I see you have a GoChain. Are you with GoChain? Okay, so and then POA system you guys have. It's like, at the end of the day, these are all function extremely quickly because you have POA networks where everyone's agreeing with everyone. Honestly, it's about who's going to capture who because you have IBM saying, hey, look, yep, where you can have POA network. Great, we're going to use that. Or if you guys capture someone else, it's kind of 
different tools to get to the same destination yeah, at the end my, of the day. My, my biggest point here is it's interoperability that's becoming the bigger issue than scalability as it is. Everyone loves talking about scalability, and I agree it's a big problem to fix. The biggest thing is there's not going to be one blockchain platform that rules them all. Anyone who thinks that is stupid, um, if I were to say so quite frankly, uh, the point that everyone needs to figure out is if I have this asset that's valued at this price or this uh, certain way on my platform, how can I exchange that for your platform or for their platform? Is it a one-to-one -one atomic swap? You know, am I doing like a puffle? Like that needs to be figured out right now, and that's a whole infrastructure play. Yeah. Um, you got a question? I was wondering how you see the infrastructure plays versus the DAP plays for uh, the broader economy. Sure. Um, I think. Not, not like specific, but the, the the question is infrastructure plays versus DAP plays and value that's being captured. Um, so you're talking as to sort of what should be focused on more right now or the kind of like trends that we're seeing with both? I'll give you an example. Yep. Cardano versus a simple dApp that... Talking about how Cardano capturing value versus da uh, like applications built yeah, on top. Some, something application like uh, Abra, for example. Okay. Yeah, let's pick but it up. not circa 2015 moving forward. I, so talking about protocols versus applications, um, I'm still of the mind, I kind of like fat protocol thesis where it's like we, all these protocols are going to capture massive amounts of value. I think the tail is the applications themselves, mm. that that's going to be the end all to be all. Yeah. I think at the moment we're still in this mixed phase where you have these protocols being built. But honestly, even I love using 0x as the greatest example of this that kind of dispels this idea of protocols capturing the most value. Because at the end of the day, you take 0x, which is the decentralized exchange protocol. and 0x itself is not capturing the value. The relayers are making all the money right now. Radar Relay, Paradex, DDEX, they're, they're, they're cleaning up shop. If 0x was the first relayer on top of the 0x protocol, they would have been making a ton of money. Yep. But all this value is being captured at the application level, not the protocol level built on top of Ethereum. So I'm of the mind, I think, long tail, and even it's shifting now. People are realizing that the applications are capturing the most value. It's how they do it. We have a lot of crap applications that are kind of muddying the water, saying, oh, look, you know, tokens for dog food, for example. But you're going to see the kind of, the, I'm, I'm of the mind you're going to see the narrative shift. Um, you, kind of, you kind of see like trends and cycles. Like, uh, I hate doing this, but if you wanted to bring back the dot-com boom and how things played out there, um, you had a lot of infrastructure being built out at the start, and then you had that one application that shot off and was used very well, right? And everyone hyped it up. In our example, it's maybe crypto kitties that everyone started using and started, you know, putting obvious stress on, on infrastructure and showing where the, some of the holes lay. And now we see a very, you know, uh, then you see the prominent focus on infrastructure and what needs to be solved for that. It's the same thing with the ICO run. All of these applications sort of built up. Um, some of them caught fire, some of them didn't. Most of them caught fire, um, some of them didn't. Um, and now people are trying to figure out, well, okay, we're in a bear market. Um, if you ask Rocco and I, you know, what are the quality of clients that are coming uh, to us and speaking to us about tokenizing, they've definitely done a lot more thinking than the people who had done at the end of last year. Because now they're trying to figure out, okay, right, I want to achieve uh, X number of transactions of throughput per second because I think that's valid for my use case. Um, how am I going to do that? That's a question that no one ever asked before. They were just like, oh, we're going to write this whoop to do paper. Uh, and let's Store go. it all on IPFS. Yeah, store it all <laughs> on IPFS. And I'm like, well, OK, cool. IPFS does have its pros. But if you're going for a fully, if you value security as your highest utmost point, um, then this is something you need to figure out. Um, your point about bringing up you know, different protocols like Cardano and stuff like that, um, we're economists by nature, right? So we're not always going to be waving around, you know, like said, the Ethereum flag, but we also like to look at different kind of protocols because it helps us learn uh, as to what we can integrate within Ethereum and what works and what doesn't, right? Um, and figuring out whether, you know, stuff like uh, proof of stake, delegated proof of stake, liquid proof of stake works better as a consensus mechanism um, are all things that need to be figured out right now. Um, and whether applications thrive on one platform versus the other, for example, uh, a, a kind of uh, example that I like to kind of throw around, but I don't take too seriously, is uh, if you look at like uh, EOS, right? Um, EOS has been pitched as you know extremely scalable, blah, 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 I can achieve your throughput in seconds, and that's great. It'll um, make you breakfast. <laughs> but what about the security of it? Um, how many nodes run on EOS? Does anyone know? 2021? 20, There's 21 block producers, 21. then you have a smattering yeah. of standby block it's producers. 21, right? So if there were cartels forming, as you could probably see with Lisk, uh, if there are things um, <laughs> that are being manipulated behind the scenes, you know, there's, there's different security flaws that can be seen there. Um, whereas if you're looking at things like 
Bitcoin or Ethereum where they have loads and loads and loads of nodes where it's going on a proof of work mechanism, yeah, it's really, really secure, but then you have the scalability issue. So it's all trade-offs and that's the kind of incentives that we're looking at. Um, I think I think we're out of time, but if anyone else has questions. Yes. <laughs> To quickly, quickly speak about this, a lot of this is going to happen um, on second layer solutions. A lot of these apps that require, I think, base chain scaling is kind of, you know, mixed waters. But I think a lot of it's going to happen on second layer solutions, like Ethereum. Take for example, plasma chains, state channels, um, and all those eventually, you know, right onto the base chain at an X interval or whenever you close a state channel. Um, but unfortunately, I think we're totally out of time. Uh, However, anyone here, out. please, we'll be outside. If you have any more questions, we're here to talk. Uh, but we got to go. And thank you so much for for uh, listening and being here.